Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussions, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Brent S., Cindy W., Paul M., and Todd A. Clive Johnson has joined us on the show today. Clive is president, CEO, and director of B2 Gold, an upper mid-tier producing company with gold mines and various stage projects across Africa, Asia, and Central South America. The company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol BTG and also on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol B-T-O. Mr. Johnson, good to have you on the show and welcome. Yeah, pleasure to be with you, Andrew. Well, Clive, I suspect most of our audience has heard of B2 Gold and Clive Johnson before, but will you tell us a little bit about how you came into this business, Clive, a bit on your background, and then why this business attracted you? Well, I've been involved in this for quite a long time now. I started as a very young man in mining exploration work here in uh, British Columbia. We were based in Vancouver, so here in British Columbia and up in the Yukon, and I was involved in, uh, as a student trying to pay my way to university, involved in exploration field work. That's really where it started. And then we um, we formed a, a contracting company, myself and some of the other guys, and uh, built that company into a pretty successful uh, contracting consulting company, looking not just for gold, but various metals, and working for some of the bigger mining companies and doing all sorts of interesting jobs up in the, the mountains and um, in the wilds of British Columbia and the Yukon. And um, we decided after a period of time of making building a successful company to, to go public and see if we could maybe find some gold for ourselves and some shareholders instead of doing it for the big companies. So basically over time in the early 80s, we went public and um, in the 80s, we had some good expression success. And then um, this company was called Bima Gold was our first a public company. Actually, it's an amalgamation of three companies we started in the early 80s. So Bima Gold started as a, an exploration company, and uh, we were quite successful quite quickly with uh, building a mine in Idaho and then moving on to Chile, uh, two world-class discoveries in Chile, uh, built a mine there and ultimately went to South Africa and also uh, to the far east of Russia, which was quite an adventure, to say the least, um, and built a gold mine there. And we're building a, a second gold mine there called Kupel, one of the richest gold discoveries in the world in the last 50 years, in, in this one in the far east of Russia as well. So a very successful company. We were on our way to becoming a million ounce year producer in BMO. So this is around mid 80s to into the 2000s. So we were projecting some dramatic growth, especially with the Kupel mine in Russia coming on. But then Kinross, the larger Canadian gold producer, showed an interest and they came in and wanted to make an offer to our shareholders. We really weren't interested in that, to be honest with you, as management. It was kind of our baby, but we take it very seriously when you're a public company that you work for the shareholders. So we had 75,000 shareholders. So Kinross came in and, and made an offer to our shareholders that we felt was our obligation to take to the shareholders, and they ended up acquiring, taking over Bima Gold for about $3.5 billion using uh, Kinross's shares in a, in, a, in, a, in a share exchange. So our shareholders voted in favor of the deal, made sense in lots of ways. It was a 38% premium to our share price at the time. So we decided to move on and see if we could do it again. So in 2007, we formed B2 Gold at zero. Again, similar to Bima Gold. So we took the same, a lot of the same executive management technical team that had built Bima into a successful company, and we decided to do it again as founders of the company. So B2 Gold started in 2007, and we um, started off with a joint venture in Colombia, and then we moved on to Nicaragua, acquired a project there and built a mine there in 2010-11. That was successful, and then we moved from there to acquiring a producing gold mine in the Philippines, Masbati, which has been a great success for us. And ultimately, we also acquired another development project called Ojikoro in Namibia, and we built that mine successfully in um, 2015. That would have been 16, and that significantly increased our production profile. And then the last deal we did, uh, the acquisition was a very exciting opportunity in Mali in West Africa in a belt of successful gold mines. And we had the opportunity to do a friendly takeover of an Australian company called Papillon. They had done a great job in exploration and feasibility, but they couldn't 
uh, raise the money to go and build the mine. It was a very negative time, 2016, for, for building gold mines, largely because of the failure of too many gold mining companies of attempting to build gold mines over the last 10 years. So the industry was out of favor and the construction was out of favor. Um, but we have a track record of doing it well and doing it. We do it ourselves. We build our own mines. We basically do everything ourselves. We um, don't use a lot of contractors or consultants. And that's about accountability. We want everyone to be accountable to each other, accountable to our shareholders, accountable to the, the countries we work in and their, and their citizens. So the best way to do that is to do it yourselves and have an extremely experienced team. So between BEMA and Beach of Gold, we have about 280 years of collective experience in the industry, not just in the industry, but working together, actually, between BEMA and Beach of Gold with our senior executive team. Everything from exploration, legal, finance, uh, building mines, running mines, and all the other things that go into it. So... One of the most experienced groups, if not the most, in I think, in the in the history of the gold mining space. So we built the um, Fakola mine, our most recent success, in two and a half years, um, on, on three months ahead of schedule, on budget for $450 million. But we also built it with a view to expanding it. So that was two and a half years ago. We just poured our millionth ounce of gold from Fakola in December of last year, and it produced about 460,000 ounces of gold at very low costs. Last year and this year, we're expanding the mill again. We're expecting to produce 600,000 ounces of gold from Fukola. It's the seventh lowest cost coal mine in the world today. So it continues to grow, and we have great expression upside there in addition to what we've already done. So that puts us at about 960,000 ounces for 2019 of consolidated gold production between the three mines. So that's the Ojikoto mine in Namibia, the Masbati mine in the Philippines, and the biggest one, 60% of our production this year will come from Fukola at 600,000 ounces. Very low cost producer, all in sustaining costs are probably going to be somewhere around $800 an ounce. That's all in. And we are um, rapidly uh, paying down debt. We should be debt free in the third quarter of this year and generating huge amounts of, um, of cash flow. We started a dividend policy late last year, which has been very well received. And the idea is to continue to do what we've done so well for so long which has continued to grow by accretive acquisitions, building mines, but also through exploration. You know, we have one of the best gold exploration teams in the world, and we continue, whether it's acquisitions, we continue to find more gold, or whether it's in our own right, in exploration projects. So we're exploring the world worldwide, really, uh, places like Uzbekistan, Japan, and other interesting areas all over the world. We have a reputation for going where others fear to tread, and I think the reason that's been so successful, frankly, it's about delivering on the promises you make to presidents of countries and citizens of countries, if you go in and tell people you're going to build a gold mine, create a lot of jobs, pay a lot of taxes, and you're going to do it in two and a half years or whatever, then it's really important that you back up what you say and you actually do it. And we've had, I think, one of the reasons for our success has been the corporate culture, which I call it an extension of the Canadian culture. And it's about fairness, respect, and transparency in the way you treat people around the world. So, so that's, a, I guess, a snapshot of where we are. We're about a $4 billion U.S. company today. As I said, we started at zero market cap. 11 years ago, so we've probably been the most dramatic growth company in the gold space. Um, and now we're looking at this enviable position of, yes, we're seeing a better gold price, but we never do anything based on the fact that we believe gold is going higher. That's a mistake in our industry and a long-term strategy. We've always believed that you have to deal with the gold price environment you're in and try and do something that makes sense and makes money for your shareholders. I guess a case in point there is when we built the first gold mine in Russia in 1998, in the far east of Russia called the Judetta Mine, when we financed to build that mine, gold was $300 an ounce, or not $1,300, $300 an ounce. Yet we were able to somehow finance and build a gold mine in Russia. Um, that's the kind of, I guess, way we view the industry and our perseverance to do things that make sense. It's a big mistake in our industry, and so many have done it, to acquire projects because, and thinking you'll be okay if you overpay because you're going to find more gold and our gold's going to go higher in price. That's not a rational business plan in my point, from my point of view. So we've had the same strategy for <clears throat> well over 30 years now as a public company. So a little background, um, we're the founders of the company. You don't see that too many $4 billion companies in this space of the, the people you're talking to and the shareholders you're talking to are the founders of the company. Um, I think that's important. When I look to invest in something, I want people that are passionate. I want people that know what they're doing and have success, history of success. I also want them to have skin in the game. That's a very attractive thing to me. And one of the failings of the gold mining space, in my mind, there's been too many hired guns coming in for short term trying to make money and not really having a long term credible strategy and making some big mistakes through uh, impatience, perhaps over aggressiveness and just bad technical 
and bad management. I hate to say it, but it's just been a reality of the gold space. That's one of the reasons why gold stocks have been so out of favor for a while. Well, very well. I really appreciate the exhaustive overview, Clive, there, and also very extensive experience, I would point out, uh, all over the world. So commendable because very few teams have actually done that. And I share a lot of your views related to the industry. And I want to talk a little bit more about that before we get into a little bit more of B2 gold and then move on to some other topics. First mm -hmm. off, where are we at in this gold market cycle, Clive? Well, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, we all know about the volatility of gold. We've, we've seen some of it quite recently here. I think, um, you know, we we're, we have the luxury of being ambivalent about the gold price because our argument to potential shareholders or shareholders of, of, of each gold is that you don't buy our company because you think gold's going higher. If it goes higher, that should be a bonus. That should be the gravy on investment in a gold company. You should buy our shares because we make a lot of money. We're very profitable. We pay a dividend and we have a pipeline of projects to continue to grow the company uh, organically and look at opportunistic acquisitions along the way that makes sense. But we've never been built on the idea, as I said earlier, that gold has to go higher. Uh, that's, a, that's a very bad strategy in my mind. We're not gold bugs. We don't believe gold has to go higher next year or five years from now. Um, so we, we built this all around the idea that whatever the gold price is, we can be profitable and continue to grow the company. Having said that, I do like the signs of what we're seeing in the gold market today. Uh, just by just so just to point out, every hundred dollars that gold goes up increases our cash from operations by a hundred million dollars a year. So we're extremely leveraged to the gold price. My point is that for the generous funds, particularly the generous investor, you don't need to buy us as your gold exposure. That's that's part of it. It's it's a big part of it, but the bigger part of it is the success of the company without gold rising. Um, but I like the signs of the market in the sense that, one, for one reason, supply, we haven't been, there's been very little expiration done in the world in the last 10 years. We've been one of the more aggressive companies in that regard. So there's been very, very few new discoveries and there's very few Focola type deposits out there today for people to, um, to acquire and build. Um, it takes about the average companies around 10 or 12 years from first drill hole discovery to producing gold. We've got it down to five, but we're a little different from most companies. So therefore, if you think about it, with a lack of exploration money, money spent for so many years, then lack of discoveries, even if we crank up exploration now and start making discoveries, they're not going to come into play for the next eight to, eight to 10 or 12 years. So I think the supply of gold is going to start, it's, going to, it's already dropping. It's going to continue to drop. So as a very fundamental supply demand basis, I see that as a likely positive factor for the gold price going forward. Also, just the turmoil in the world, the, the Trump factor and all those factors that come with that, as we've seen recently, but also um, debt. You know, I mean, the, the gold bugs will tell you that the world is awash in debt and, the, you know, the Republicans don't seem to care anymore about worrying about deficits anymore, which is unusual. So, therefore, we've got un uncontrolled spending by governments, including the United States. Someone's going to pay that debt eventually over time. So, I think, I think we're at a potential stage here where gold could be very strong for a sustainable period of time. Once again, though, we don't have to make that part of our pitch because we don't control the gold price. I prefer to do things that we control, um, like our costs and like uh, like the projects we build. Uh, anything that gold does in terms of the upside for our shoulders and, and ourselves, we'll take it for sure. But it's, that should be the that should be the gravy on top of a, of, a, of, a, of a good fundamental investment. But I like the looks of this market, and um, I think it could have some legs to it. Well, that's a great position, Clive. I completely agree with how you've positioned things here. Now, let's talk about base metals for a moment. Your thoughts on things like copper <clears throat> and any other metal you'd like to comment on? Sure. Well, I think that, um, I mean, the bottom line is we're obviously in a time in the world where people turning their attention as they should to protecting the environment. Um, and and we, we've always taken that extremely seriously. We've been on the cutting edge of environmental responsibility and social responsibility going back decades before it had fancy titles like corporate social responsibility. We, we, we were doing that way, way back in the day. And I, I really believe in that. I think I believe there's certain places in the world where you shouldn't build gold mines. Um, and I believe that you can build, as we've seen ourselves and other companies, building a very responsible, environmentally responsible, socially responsible mines that benefit everyone. The bottom line is, unless we're going to go back to living in caves, we need metals. The base metals, copper, um, when you look at what's going on with uh, electric cars and uh, other sources of energy, etc. There's going to be a lot of need for copper and other metals, zinc, etc. As we go forward in the modern world, look at your phone. I mean, there's a lot of metals in that phone. We need to keep um, producing them. So 
I do believe that um, we're going to always need a supply of metals, but and I think that the next several years you've got China, but you've got India now, you've got many countries growing and changing, and you've got many countries going greener and greener, and that all, in my mind, actually, it, it, interesting enough, that actually can, can mean an increase in base metal consumptions, not a decrease in consumption as people go green. It's kind of a counterintuitive, but I think it's a, it's a reality. So I think that uh, for zinc and copper and and silver and of course gold. I, I think the um, I think the, the demand side I think looks very very positive going forward. And Clive, I know you've mentioned a few already, uh, but maybe what what really sticks out to you as really a major issue, if you can point out maybe one or two. I know there's more than that, but what bothers you about the mining and exploration business today, and what should be done to improve the industry? Yeah, well, there's a lot there, but I'll try and be brief. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest problems we're seeing um, now in the industry is a lack of technical capability. Um, you know, we had so, so few kids going into geology or engineering as everyone went through the whole um, you know, the whole high tech craze, and then and then now we've got the the weed craze and all these other things that were sexier looking. Um, you know, if you're in the computer software business, that's way more sexier chatting up some girl in a bar than being a miner. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I think there, there's been this, unfortunately, lack of talent going into our industry. And that's critically important. Ours is a really tough industry. I've always said there's no renaissance man in the, in the mining industry. It's such a complex industry. You need many different talented people with very different skill sets to come together as one and, and be successful, which I think we've, we're, there's other examples like Nico Eagle and a few other companies that I would put in that category, but I definitely think we're we're on the leading edge of that. So one of the first issues I think is a is a lack of talent. So you end up with consulting firms that might have a good team, but they've got several teams, and someone hires them because they don't want to put together their own technical team, and it is hard. But that's what we did over many years. But so they end up having to go outside and trust outside consultants. And one of the biggest problems in that is the fact that what you've seen over and over again was several high-profile projects in Canada and elsewhere recently is one of the critical elements is how much gold is in a ton of rock. Uh, if you get that wrong, you can build the best mill in the world, but you're never going to have a successful mine if you've under, if you've overestimated the amount of gold that's in every ton of rock. And we see that time and time again in the sector, particularly in the last five to 10 years. Projects that never should have gone into construction never should have been built because there was a poor job done of estimating the amount of gold in the ground. That's so critical. That's one of the reasons why we do that and everything else in-house. We have some of the top people in the world that drill these projects and then estimate the gold content. I can't emphasize too much how critical that is in the industry. But then there's also been, you know, sadly, just a terrible acquisitions done. Um, companies like Eldorado and others have just done terrible acquisitions and lost billions of dollars on their shoulders. And they can't blame it on the gold price. If you really look at the, the cycle of gold, the gold hasn't been the problem for the last 10 years. It's been just this, some very poor work done. And, and you know, sadly, very bad management. I hate to always sound like I'm ragging on the industry. I just believe in accountability. I expect to be held accountable by our right. shoulders. And I expect we need we need more institutional investors and more all investors to hold management teams accountable. The reason people lost so much money in the last 10 years in the gold space isn't because of gold price, it's because of bad management. And that's really frustrating and disappointing for those of us that are doing it right, because we all, of course, in life get tarred with the same brush. So the technical side is huge. Greed is a big factor. Um, we've had too many guys come in, ex-investment bankers or other business guys thinking they're smart and they can do what I do, and they come in and they parachute into a company, uh, and uh, they're you know they're looking to make as much money as they can in three to five years and get out. They're motor, they're deal junkies a lot of the time. They don't have good technical teams and they don't respect the technical side of the business. So I think the good news about all that, having said all that, the good news is it's changing. It's changing partly because it has to change because so many companies have lost so much money. So you're going to see more and more companies getting together. We need, we need that. We need less gold mining companies that are better run. So we need a lot of the pretenders, a lot of the companies that have tried and failed to get out of the way. And if they have a good project, they need to give it up for their shareholders and take shares in somebody else that can actually succeed uh, in the industry. So I like the trend that we're seeing. We're always looking at m and opportunities, but frankly, I don't see us going there um, because we have a great pipeline of projects and we're not getting value in our view for Ficola, which we're expanding right now and all the other things we're doing, looking for the next Ficola, and we've got a new project coming on in Colombia. So we're sitting back. We did the heavy lifting when no one else was acquiring and doing what we did. We did it. Now everyone else is going to run around trying to find things to build. That's going to be tough. So the competition is increasing. But I like 
the fact that we're heading to, towards less companies that have to be better run to attract the shareholders uh, investment dollars. You know, back in the day when gold made a move like this, you'd have a lot of people running out buying any company with the, with the word gold in their name. And that that's the recipe for disaster as we saw. The good news, I think, is the investors are a lot more sophisticated so far today. They're looking for quality companies. Even though gold's gone up, they're still looking for quality companies. You know, $1,500 gold price does not make you a better gold producer. It can make you a worse gold producer, actually. Because if you start believing gold's going to stay there, you can see your costs creep up because of a lack right. of discipline. So so I think um, those are some of the key factors we need. Uh, well, we need to run it like a business. There's, I've said this for years. There, there aren't many businessmen in the gold mining business. And that sounds crazy, but it's true. There's a lot of technical people, and some of them are good. They don't make great managers necessarily in terms of CEOs. But there's good technical people, and they're desperately important in the business, as I've said. And then you get the business side more, the deal junkie side. And those people hopefully have had their run now because they do a lot of damage to the market. They always seem to make a lot of money as well, which is kind of interesting. When the shareholders lose a lot, you get some of these CEOs walk away with $50 million or more. So that's something I find quite offensive, and I think their shareholders do now as well. So I think that's changing. I think there's a real positive for going forward in the industry, less companies, better run, and more discipline. And long-term strategy is critical. We've had a long-term strategy for 35 years about how to run this business and how to grow successfully. Um, and I don't see a lot of, I haven't seen in the past, a lot of companies with any kind of coherent strategy. Gold goes up, they buy stuff. Gold goes down, they panic. And uh, they overpay for things when it's up, and then they panic when gold's down. So uh, it needs to be run like a business. You touched on a lot of key points, and one of the things we've had trouble with has been overcompensation at early stage companies who certainly don't deserve it. What is your view on compensation in general in this sector? And can you speak to, for investors, the importance of management team selection? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree. Uh, there's there's no doubt. It, it, it's pretty shocking when you look at the, over the years at the compensation that have been paid by some gold mining companies uh, for, for very, for frankly, very poor performance. I always find that shocking. Shareholders need to start speaking up more and more. And I, this is a frustration I have sometimes when I'm talking to um investors, you know, sometimes all investors, but sometimes particularly the big investors, they'll bitch and moan at me about the, what happened at El Dorado or whatever. And I'll always say the same thing to them. I said, well, you know, did you go to the last annual general meeting and did you put your hand up in the question period and ask the CEO how he justified his compensation and the money he's made when they've lost so much money? And they go, no, 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 we just sold our shares. Well, that's not holding the management and the board of directors accountable. Keep 25% of your shares and go to the AGM and stand up and ask the tough questions. I expect that if we falter, if we have problems, and you know, this industry, like every other industry, has its issues. But I expect to be accountable to the shareholders. In our last annual general meeting in June of last year, 80% of our shares were voted. That's remarkable for a public company. That tells you that our shareholders are engaged. They have an opinion. They have a view. Now, fortunately, 95% of them voted for the, for the directors, which means management. So we clearly have the support of our shareholders. But I, I think that's one of the problems. So it's one thing for shareholders to, as they should, understandably, be pissed off at, at the executives and boards of directors of some of these companies. But they don't do anything about it. Now, we've seen some of them, Polson and some of them, try to, to do some of that. And that's good. But there's a real difference between... I'm, in my mind, there's a whole, there's a difference between accountability and activism. Accountability is going to an AGM and trying to hold and write, writing letters to directors and trying to hold them accountable for compensation and bad decisions, etc. That's accountability. But long before you get into, um, long before you get into going after companies and trying to take them over, um, th that's a big step. And I don't, I think that's the ultimate step. But th before that, it's about accountability. Try and hold these companies accountable for what they're doing and try and rein them in on compensation. The, you know, the, 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 the aggressive takeover route changing management, that should be the last step in my view. One that should be taken ultimately, but it should be the last step. So um, so I, I, th I think there's a lot of work to be done there to hold companies accountable. And if it's a company that's got a good asset that is entrenched management, they're not, they clearly may claim that they'll take an offer, but they don't want to. They want to protect their jobs. They don't run, it's not their baby. It's not their company. It's the shade they work for their shoulders. So we have to root on entrenched management. We have to continue to pressure board directors to realize that if they turn down and don't, don't take an offer to their shoulders that's in a, that, that, and give the shoulders a right to decide, um, they should be held accountable and they should be liable for that and they should, there should be financial consequences. That's actually true in law. It's just not enacted very often. So I think there's, um, I think there's a whole lot of work that can be done 
by shareholders, not necessarily going out as first step and kicking management out. I, I think that, you, you know, you, you go through the other steps, as I mentioned, of accountability first, but there's a lot of work that can be done there, and some of it's happening, but more and more, I, I want to see that. I, I want to see more shareholders stand up for their rights. Agreed. Well, let's move on, Clive. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about B2 Gold. Um, can you share with us the key goals, maybe some production goals, and your plans specifically for 2020? Sure. Well, we're looking at um, breaking the million ounce threshold this year in 2020. So we've got, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a group on our website. There's a really good presentation, our latest presentation that shows you a, a growth chart, and it's pretty dramatic from 2012 or to, the, to up to where we are today, um, and getting to a million ounces this year. And as I mentioned, that that's based on the from the three mines, and it's going to be all in sustaining costs of around $800 an ounce, one of the, the one, uh, you know, very low cost profile, especially in today's gold environment. Yes. Um, so that's the focus there. The focus will be continue to um, generate tremendous amounts of cash flow, um, pay a dividend. And then, then that's the ultimate goal I had for a long time was, I think it's very attractive to have a company that um, is profitable, take some of the cash we generate from our profitable mines and build additional mines or find additional gold, but take some of it and dividend it out to the, to the shareholders, give something back to the shows. That's been very well received, and there's very few gold companies that pay that pay a dividend. So that's going to continue to be the focus. But the rest of it is to find out what's in our pipeline. You know, I mentioned we're expanding Focola uh, right now, so it'll produce 600,000 ounces um, this year, up from 460,000 ounces uh, last year. So that's a big focus. But it's the same construction team that built the mill. It's the same guys. I'm very confident they're going to do it on schedule or ahead of schedule on budget again. That's kind of what we do. So that that's a, a focus that I don't think is reflected in the market, um, the 600,000 ounces from Fukola. Um, and in addition to that, we are have a tremendous exploration targets on the large Fukola property. So about 20 kilometers to the north of Fukola is an area called Anaconda, which is a very large area uh, that has a, um, a cap of heavily weathered gold mineralization that has got about a million ounces so far down to 50 meters, but below that, the, 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 the geologic model, not to get too technical, but the geologic model is, is there potentially other Fercolas, which involves the feeder zones feeding into this area that became weathered. So there's extensive mineralization, and over the last few months, we've started to hit underneath the weathered material in the sulfide, in the hard rock, we started to hit some really good gold intercepts um, in drilling, reminiscent of the early days of Fercola. So we're pretty excited about that. So we think there may be another another uh, multi-million ounce gold discovery in the same in the same area. Um, so we're looking at that, and we're going to aggressively pursue that. I think there's eight rigs heading on site or going back to work now on site after the Christmas break. So that's going to be an important thing. Once again, what's in the pipeline? Additionally, Grama Latte is a project in Colombia we've been involved with for many years with Angular Gold Ashanti. And it's a now a 50-50 joint venture. We're the operator. That's just changed, and it's a low-grade but but interesting project in Colombia, a country we like, and the area in Colombia we're in is the best area you can be in to build a gold mine there. So that project is getting to the decision point quite quickly. Um, it's around 4 million ounces of gold so far. Low grade, but lots of very attractive uh, aspects of it, metallurgy and strip ratio that make it very attractive, even though it's a low grade deposit. We're looking to complete a final feasibility study at this project, Gramalati, by the end of this year. There's virtually no value in our share price for it to date because of the fact that it's been on hold for a long time. And to be honest with you, there was some very poor, well, there was some less than uh, stellar work done on geologic modeling when we weren't operator. And that's all been remedied now. So all of a sudden we have a new look at this project and it looks a lot better in terms of the potential economics. We're drilling it now in terms of infill drilling it. That means taking inferred mineralization and, and closing the drill spacing to turn it into indicated and ultimately reserves. Um, we expect that to be successful. We're doing that now. So by the end of the year, we'll have a final feasibility. We have a, we're have we already well along the way in the permitting process in Columbia. We could be making a decision early next year to build that as our next major mine. Um, so that's the potential for somewhere around 450,000 ounces of gold a year. So far, the economics, if the drilling pans out, uh, and it's infill drilling, we don't expect surprises. It's quite a homogeneous ore body. But if the infill drilling pans out, this is a project that should become a mine. And uh, as I said, there's very little value in our share price for it now. We'll be coming out in the next three weeks with three very important news releases. Um, one of them is going to be a, a preliminary, an updated preliminary economic assessment of Gramalate showing the economics 
the new economics for this project. Um, so that's an important milestone, and that will be out in the next couple of weeks. In addition to that, we're going to have our 2020 detailed production profile and cost estimates, our budget coming out next week. And somewhere in the middle of all that as well, there'll be a new updated geologic resource based on Focolo drilling, which we've been extensively drilling to infill drill that as well. So lots of news coming up uh, as we hit marketing season and what we're doing. So we'll have lots to, to update our shareholders on. Now, Clive, over on the operations side, and I know your cost profile is already quite fantastic. What areas is B2 Gold working on or looking at to reduce costs and improve efficiencies going forward? Well, you know, if you look at it, I mean, we're always working on that, but I think that, um, and you can always make improvements, but we are one of the lowest costs on a per ton basis. Our three mines are some of the lowest cost per ton open pit gold mines in the world, and they're not in the easiest areas of the world like Nevada and stuff. So we're very good at what we do. We're extremely good at mining. Uh, once again, we don't use contractors. Uh, we do our own mining because we begrudge them the profit, and why would we pay someone to do it? We want to control it. It's about accountability again. So we have a, just one of our great strengths is the technical side of it, the, the day-to-day, um, you know, mining. And also it's, it's the way we we have about, nine, on average, 98% of our employees are of the country that we're in. Um, we don't use a lot of expats. We, we, we train people extremely well. And we also have a – it's all about what I said earlier about culture, fairness, respect, and transparency, the way we treat people and our workers in the local community. So we have a stellar um, a safety record. We've gone – recently went over three years – Masbati in the Philippines with an open pit gold mine with 2,000 employees. We went three years without a single lost time accident. So uh, there's no there's no factory in North America that could boast that safety record. So I guess it shows again the, our commitment to all aspects of what we're doing. So we'll continue to look at improvement. Now, I always tell investors if you want to see if a company is well run, a good place to start is their safety record. If they're taking care of the people and they're running a safe mine, and our environment is responsible, there's a pretty good chance they're pretty good at mining as well. So I think that's a, you know, for the amateur looking at the companies trying to figure out how do I judge these guys? Well, what have they done before? But also, how seriously do they take safety and environmental responsibility? Because those are things that you really have to have discipline to be that safe in a mine. Every day starts with, every shift starts with a safety briefing. And that is absolute religion. And that's what we've been able to do. And that also really encourages your people around the world that you, you, you know, you're, you're looking out for their interests. They're well paid. Um, they're well fed and they're respected, including their safety. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think why we've had so much success in all these different countries in the world. So we'll continue to look at optimizing. There's always things you can try and do to tweak the recoveries, which is a huge part of our industry. How much of the gold can you get out of the ground? But once again, we do have one of the top metallurgists in the world has been with us for 20 odd years um, and continue to add other talented people in all areas. So the best way, I mean, we're a low cost producer today. Um, and that will continue. And then beyond that, it's also our ability to find additional ounces. You know, we have this tremendous exploration team. Every deal we've ever done, we don't pay for ounces that might be there. But in every deal we've done, we've found a lot more gold. So that adds value as well, not only to the mine life, but depending on the grade of what, you, what you're finding, that can improve the economics. And we're always looking at new technology. You know, there have been some technological changes in the industry. I think there's lots more to come. And we're on the cutting edge of looking at uh, the various things that are happening in the world that can increase efficiencies. Uh, in, in, in everything from the mining, the recovery of gold, and everything else we're doing. Well, that sounds like a pretty tight ship to me, Clive. Mm. Well, let's let's. Uh, I want to want to ask you a little bit more about the key people over at B2 Gold. Is there a couple key people there that you want to make mention of? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a, a founding group of us that were BMO before, and and uh, with some of the founding executives of B2 Gold, and 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 over time we've added a tremendous depth and experience to that team. You know, we have a. We have a slide I mentioned earlier that we talk about the key start success, and one of them I, th I mentioned was experience. So of the people that together, we have 280 years of collective experience working together, not just in the industry. But that's everything from uh, the financial side. Uh, Mike Cinnamon's our chief financial officer. He's done a fantastic job. He came on about four years ago now, but he was our auditor from Pricewaterhouse for 12 years before that. So we've seen every gold mining company out there. And he uh, was our auditor and knows the company extremely well. He, he's been fantastic. So he he replaced one of the founding guys who uh, retired. Uh, Mike's been a great addition to the team. Another key player um, in making this all happen is Bill Lytle. So Bill Lytle is an engineer, and Bill um, was working with us in Russia. This is, this is one of the things you'll see in our group, the consistency of people being together for so long. When we started in Russia, Bill was involved in, uh, in permitting the Russian opportunities. He was involved in engineering work and also CSR work. 
back in the day. So he's got a very well-rounded experience on the technical side, but also in areas, other really critical areas like like permitting and CSR. So Bill was um, George Johnson, who was one of the founders, who was an excellent mining engineer, and he was a real one of the keys to our success in transforming from an exploration company to a producer, which is almost never happens successfully. But George Johnson was a fantastic engineer. He was the architect of a lot of that. He mentored Bill for many years. George retired and is on our board. But Bill has just stepped in and done a fantastic job, I guess, in the last four years now. Uh, but he also knew everyone in the company. He was with us in Russia, so he's been with us, Bima, and then back to B2 Gold. So um, he's, he's key as well. And then Tom Garrigan is our senior VP exploration. Uh, Tom and I started working together in the in the early '80s in the Yukon. Um, you know, I know what you're thinking. We were we were very young. I think I was 15. Tom was maybe 12. But I'm kidding. But anyway, we <laughs> it was a long time ago, uh, and, and uh, that's how long Tom and I've been working together. So, uh, and he's one of the best recognized widely as one of the best gold exploration geologists in the world and geologists uh, in general. But um, so that's a key thing: the relationship between business. I'm the business guy in between technical was so critical. And when, when you go that far back, you know, you, you learn to work together. And, you know, despite the what I, I guess I'm perceived as a bit of an aggressive persona, but where I like to think of a passionate guy, but I'm not a micromanager. You don't have people of this level of talent around together for 30 years if you're an asshole or you're a micromanager. So I think that's one of the keys. I think the guys would tell you that even if I wasn't in the room. I think they would say that uh, I think they would say that. Uh, I, 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 I not only do I let them do their jobs, I encourage them to do their jobs and I encourage them to think outside the box and grow. So that's one of the real, I think that's one of the great strengths is, is the being together. And we have like 9.30 every Tuesday morning in Vancouver. We have a conference call with everybody, the entire executive team around the world. And despite the dramatic growth we've had over 10 years, which has been incredible from zero production to, to a million ounces, we've had, we managed to stay on top of it by communicating and, and by breaking down the silos that often happen in different industries, getting the exploration, the exploration guys to respect and communicate with the engineers and vice versa. That's one of the big problems in our industry is the silos where people don't like each other, don't talk to each other. They somehow seem each other as a threat. I've really worked hard on breaking down those barriers. And so I think that's one of the key things. Other way, Roger Roche is our in-house counsel, but he's much more than that. He's executive VP. And Roger and I go back to the early 80s in the Yukon as well. He was in law school at the time. Um, when he came up to take over my job at expediting in a small town in the Yukon, I got promoted to Whitehorse, the big smoke. Um, but uh, so that's how far we go back as well. So you start to get the picture of just a and Tom, under Tom, there's a team of geologists that have been a lot of them been with him for 20, 25 years. So it's quite an extraordinary group in in in, in that regard. Yeah, and if you've worked together that long, I suspect the machine is well greased, and uh, it certainly makes things easier as you move along. Well, I want to talk uh, a little bit about growth, and I know you mentioned some of the factors before, but just again, growth for B2 Gold going forward, where would that come from, Clive, as far as continued in-house advancement and development of existing assets? Do you care about acquisitions at this point? I think the, the answer for this year is, is um, looking at organic growth. By the end of this year, we're going to, have, we're going to know if Gramolati in Columbia is going to be our next mine and it has the potential to be a significant um, low-cost open pit gold mine. So we're going to know that by or before the end of this year. Um, on terms of 20 kilometers north of Fakola and what we call Anaconda, the area I was talking about, we're hitting it very hard with a bunch of drill rigs. We're going to have a very good sense by the end of this year if we have another multi-million ounce discovery on our hands uh, 20 kilometers away from our biggest mine. Um, and there's many other exploration things we're doing all around our projects and all around the world. But, but when you've got that kind of pipeline for growth, I think you're doing your shareholders a disservice if you look to take your shares and go and try and acquire something. You know, the, the, the cheapest ounces are always the ones you find um, and, and always have been. Most producers aren't good at finding it, so they have to buy them. We're a bit of a unique company because we're, we're extraordinarily good at exploration, but we can also build it and run it as we've seen. So that's one of the things that separates us from the pack. I think most exploration companies should never try and produce gold, and most producers are not very good at finding gold. I always said years ago, why can't we have the best of both worlds? And that's been part of the challenge, but successful challenge to maintain this great exploration team, but also you know become a builder and a producer of mines. So the, for this year, let's find out what's in our pipeline. I think an important point here is that we were doing acquisitions, creative acquisitions, what I mean by accretive is something that has a good return on, on, on investment at the, at the gold price at the time or lower, 
but also doesn't need a higher gold price and their expiration of success to justify your purchase price. That's just not a good business model, and that's what too many did in the past. So we've always been very disciplined in acquisitions, but we're prepared to be contrarian, and this is a lot of our success by going to Chile in 88 and Russia, you know, and Chile, Russia in 98, what we've done in B2. It's been a very contrarian play, and obviously you're going to have your critics when you're doing something contrarian. That's life. You know, bold initiatives, by definition, are done by the few, not the many. So we've always not realized that by being contrarian, such as acquiring Focola four years ago and building it, I had many shareholders tell me, well, I can't buy your stock. And I said, why? Because they said, well, because you don't have free cash flow. And I said, yeah, but that's because we're using some cash flow to build a fantastic low-cost gold mine, one of the best in the world. Um, and that's what we should do. And they said, well, no, no. But so many of the other companies have screwed up so badly in building coal mines, we don't trust anybody anymore. So when we acquired Focola four years ago, there was no competition, and it was recognized as one of the best undeveloped gold projects in the world. There was no competition because everyone else was so scared off of their shoulders' reaction if they did an acquisition um, that they, 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 they didn't do it. So we bought it for half a billion dollars U.S. for Focola, and it was 3.2 million ounces then, at seven plus million ounces today. But if it was as it was then four years ago, if it was around today with that 3.2 million ounces and a really good feasibility study, yes, and good expression upside. But if it was what it, now what it was then, the bidding would start at a billion. It would probably go between a billion and 1.5 billion um, to purchase for Cola. And we wouldn't be the buyer because of 1 billion to 1.5 billion for 3 million ounces would be overpaying. But we wouldn't have done that. So the good news about being contrarian is you don't have a lot of competition. The bad news about being contrarian is you're going to have a lot of critics and cynics, and that's okay, and you prove them wrong over time. Understandably, I understand why people are so cynical about the gold mining space in the last 10 years. Look at the look at the results of, of what most gold companies did for, despite the pretty pretty healthy gold price. So um, so the, the, that that's one of the keys. So why would we go now and take our shares and try and acquire something? It's not cheaper than it was before. It's going to be way more expensive now. There's very few good projects out there. We can't find anything we like, or very very few things we like. So even if we were trading at $8 a share, and I don't think we'd be out there looking to do significant M&A, because let's find out if there's another for cola. Let's find out if grandma latte is what we think it is. Those are already in the pipeline. Those are those are free ounces. So, so that's our strategy. We're always looking at M&A. We always will. And I wouldn't rule out in the next couple of years doing an acquisition, but it's got to be something that has to pass the smell test. And the smell test is doesn't need higher gold prices or expiration success to justify what you pay for it. We're never going to change that. That's been our strategy for 30 years. So um, we'll be opportunistic, if, but I want to find out what's in our pipeline. Because if there's another for coal out there, um, and Columbia is what we think it is, there's a tremendous growth built in right there for the next couple of three years. Very well. That's a good way to go here, and I think you've got the pipeline that's worth worthy of further expansion and advancement. Well, mm. you've been able to work, Clive, with some governments and some tough jurisdictions to get your projects built out in production and sustaining for years. I know you mentioned a few before, but what key strategies would you point out to the audience that have been absolutely critical to your success dealing with these jurisdictions? Yeah, I think the secret of uh, managing political risk uh, is delivering on the promises you make. You know, if you go to a country, as I've done, um, Russia or Mali or Namibia or the Philippines, and you meet with often the president of the country, and then you walk in and say, well, you know, we're a Western Canadian company, and we want to come and build a gold mine in your country, and it's going to take two and a half years. We're going to spend, you know, $300 million to build it, um, and we're going to create all these jobs, and they're going to be good, safe jobs. We're going to take care of the environment. We're going to do lots of social programs in the community that makes sense. We're going to try and leave a sustainable community behind after the mine is finished and bottom line is we're going to pay lots and lots of taxes it's going to be a win-win so if you say that to a foreign leader in a third world country particularly they're not like us they're not the cynical as us. they believe you they think you're going to do it <laughs> so it's probably not a bad idea to do it because at the end of the day they're out there promising their citizens their constituents that we have this great canadian company coming in here and they're going to do all this stuff and they're, they're repeating what i said so if we don't deliver, not only are we letting the president down and the country down, we're putting the leaders of these countries in a very difficult position. So sometimes when you see gold mining companies or other mining companies getting in problems around the world with what they call political risk or the government screwing them over taxes, often if you dig a little deeper, you'll find out that the company didn't do what the company said they were going to do, and they lost the trust of the government. And sometimes government will say, well, we don't trust you anymore. 
So the only way we can get any money out of you is to increase the royalty, increase the taxes. No CEO is going to sit there and tell you or other shareholders, yeah, we screwed up and the government's pissed off at us. No one's going to admit that. They're going to blame the government. So I think all the countries we've been in over all the years, we've never, knock on wood, had serious problems with government. So it starts with delivering your promises, but then it starts with fairness, respect, and transparency. No surprises. Don't go into somewhere, even if you've got a permit, and start, knock, start knocking trees down without going to the local community and telling them what you're doing and why and help use them to cut down the trees. But it, it's those simple things, and I do think it comes down to respect and how you treat people. And maybe it's because all the guys in our company, including myself, I started as a line cutter and a claim staker. There's not a lot of silver spoons running around here or, you know, Ivy League guys. This is uh, We've all worked hard in our lives. I think we have a tremendous amount of respect for the miners, the workers, the exploration people, and, and the people that live in the communities. Run. I think that's a key cultural aspect of it. Um, treat people the way you'd like to be treated. You know, it sounds simple, um, and we've tried to live that for 35 years, and, and I do think that's one of our key recipes for success. Clive, let's move over to Nicaragua for a moment. Mm -hmm. What were the driving reasons to sell off the Nicaraguan operations to caliber mining? Yeah, well, those that may not be familiar with the detail, we, we, we basically have been involved in Nicaragua. That was our first producing assets in, in B2 <clears throat> 11, 12 years ago. And they, they were fantastic for us. I mean, it launched our, launched our production profile. Uh, we, we Very cheap acquisition, $45 million we paid for those assets. One small underground open pit mine that wasn't doing very well that needed an investment um, and uh, bad labor union history, et cetera. We came in and made that a better mine, invested money, and dealt with the local people in a very positive way. That's been a great success story. And then the other mine, the Libertad, it was a struggling, a failed mine before. We came in and rebuilt the mill and made it a great success. So we've had 10, 11 years of really solid production from Nicaragua, very profitable, the largest you know, taxpayer in the country, uh, great jobs, great environment protection. It was a great success for us. Now, we started to get to the point where the mines were starting to run out of mine life or quite soon, especially at the Libertad. And there's exploration upside there. So Caliber has a lot of other assets. So I'm sure Caliber is going to continue to be able to feed the mill there. And they can they can focus on the country. And they, they're, they're good. They've been there for a long time. But we didn't just sell the assets in Nicaragua. We vended them into Caliber, and we now own 32% of the shares of Caliber. And that's because we were very happy with Nicaragua, despite the recent political turmoil. I think it's going to right itself. And I, I, we love the country. We love the people. I mean, it's a very misunderstood country in the world, especially in, in, in Central America. It, it, is, it is so different from Honduras or in Guatemala, any of these countries, both in violence, both in education, um, infrastructure, being able to do business in the country. So we, we're, I'm a huge fan of Nicaragua and will remain so going forward. We didn't sell out. We didn't, we didn't change our ownership in it because of anything to do with the politics. Um, we did it because we want to focus on bigger mines now. That's what we're doing. We've grown a lot. And it was really important to get someone else in there who could really focus on Central America. And they're good guys. They've done a good job in Caliber. I'm a shoulder myself as well as, as Beach of Gold being a shoulder. And they've been in the country for almost 10 years in the exploration side. So they inherit all of our people. We care very much about our people. So our 1,200 employees, they've, they all work for Caliber now. And it's been a great transition. And the Caliber was an exploration team. They inherited a great mining team, a great executive team in Nicaragua. And the country managers are Nicaraguan, as we tend to do it. So I think it's a win-win-win for everyone. The Nicaraguan government's happy with the situation. It's important, once again, to go and explain that and the rationale of what we're doing. I think it's good for Caliber. I think it's you know good, good for the Nicaraguan people. I think it's good for the Beach of Gold shareholders. We're still involved. We'll still benefit from the upside. But we get to go and focus on what we need to be focusing on, which are now uh, some of the larger opportunities that we have. Yeah, certainly you guys have mastered the political situation there. Um, you guys have been highly successful in light of even the issues that have occurred over the last two years. And I want to ask you just a little bit more about that, Clive. What are your thoughts on Nicaragua going forward as a mining jurisdiction, given the current political social debacle in the country, and thoughts on how you see things might come out? You know, as I said before, Nicaragua is a very different country um, with a very, with them, than what we see, um, and, and, and unfortunately, in a lot of the other Central American countries. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the caravan or the invasion force, I guess as Trump likes to call it, coming from Central America trying to get to the United States. Uh, have you ever heard any Nicaraguans mentioned in that? You never do. They don't really particularly want to go to the States. They'll tend to go to Costa Rica for a while and then come back to Nicaragua. So they're not, and that just tells you a lot right there. They're, they're, they're not subject to gang violence, threats, violence. It's very different in Nicaragua. It's the safest country in Central America by far. But it's also got a very 
uh, up until recently, it's, I think it's disappointing what happened because I don't think it had to happen. I think that or- Ortega has actually done a very good job uh, as a democratically elected socialist for a long time. He, you know, he attracted, he, he encouraged the capitalists to come back to Nicaragua, the coffee growers, uh, ultimately, and, 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 and made, it, made it an attractive place for companies like ours to go and successfully build a gold mine. It's been a great success. And we put Nicaragua on the map for gold mining, but what BEMA did and many other companies have gone there now. So I think it's unfortunate the, the way things happen because of the knee-jerk reaction of the government to getting cutting off, cut off from cheap Venezuelan oil. And they draconian, they brought in, in my opinion, some draconian measures uh, to try and um, help their budget, but they didn't communicate with their, with their citizens very well. And they lost the support of lots of different groups in the country. And that's something they haven't done before. They've always been good at communicating. I mean, they're, they're a party of the people. They've always done a good job of communicating with the workers, communicating with students, and, uh, and also communicating with the uh, business side. It was working quite well. So I, I, that's why I'm confident that it's going to stabilize again. And, we're, you know, people, and sometimes I see some of the, you know, some of the media stuff these days, obviously, and some of the Internet stuff is, is pretty informed when people start talking about, you know, Nicaragua having a civil war. Who are they going to have a civil war with? They're all on the same page. They don't like their government, but the government's going to have to appease the people ultimately and take steps to return it to a true democracy, which it actually was. I know because of the American history in Nicaragua, it, there's a lot of people that are that are – see it as some kind of a communist dictatorship and it's always been that way. That's just not the case of people who actually study history a little bit better than that. So I always say, and it was my father that told me a long time ago, that all people that generalize are wrong. So we should uh, not generalize about uh, countries, for sure. We shouldn't assume that every Latin American, every every um, every Central American country is a disaster, because it's just not the case. So I, I think Nicaragua going forward, if I, as a caliber shareholder personally, and also through B2 Gold, I don't see any reason to panic out of that by any means. I think that stability will return. And things are still working in the country. Uh, even while we never lost a day of production during the worst of times. And that tells you the commitment of our employees, but it tells you the government, the unions, the local people, everyone had one thing in common, even though they disagreed about a bunch of things. One thing they had in common is they wanted our minds to continue. And that's very important that everyone in the country recognized that despite what was happening, it was very intense for a while there. We were still, our workers we're showing up every day to go to work to make money by running the mine. And that, to me, tells a lot about what we've done there, but also about the people of Nicaragua. Well, you're you're certainly speaking of, of quality because uh, much of the last five years I've been there. Oh, good. Well, well, you know, you know how beautiful that country is. I mean, we, we fell in love with it, you know, and the yes. people are, well, I mean, as you know, the people are great. <laughs> I should ask you if you agree with my uh, my take on Nicaragua, since you're more of an expert than I am. No, I, I don't know about that, but I certainly agree. Well, Clive, let's talk about the future of B2 Gold as far as uh, kind of the end game. What is the end goal with this business, Clive? Is it more growth coming down the pipeline? Obviously, we discussed that. Is it to continue operating in the mid-tier area? And is there a desire to sell the business under the right terms like what you did with Bema Gold? What is the end game? Yeah, well, I, you know, frankly, I hope that this company is here you know, 30 years from now, because I just think it's such a great culture and it's such a demonstrated success, not just in, in, in the important area, of course, of being profitable and making money, but it's also the way, and I think, you know, I've talked about it a lot, but the way we've done it, that's something that's something I'm most proud of, we all are, the way we've been able to do this. Um, it shows you that, you know, mining 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 companies can be extremely responsible and can add a lot of value. We've got a lot of work to do to, to convince the world that, it's not the the, the arrogant uh, secret of mining companies of the past. So I think that's a mission that will continue with us. And I, as I said, I, I don't think I'll be here for another 30 years. I'll be pretty old by then. But um, I, I think there's a culture here and there's a, there's a great group that can, can carry this company well into the future. Um, if, and so the idea is just continue what we're doing. You know, we're not going to sit there and tell anybody, well, we want to be 2 million ounces by three years from now. I don't like doing that because then, because then you're putting pressure on and acquisitions don't come along just when you want them to, and, and expiration success doesn't. So I'm not going to put numbers on it. I'm just going to say that we're going to responsibly grow the company. We're not going to do what so many others did, which is grow for the sake of growth. That was one of the problems we had in the industry. You grow irrespective of what it costs you. You grow because your ego says grow, and some shareholders want you to grow, so you do it sometimes when you shouldn't try and do it. So that, that's the first thing. I think that stay the course, and I mean, I don't think we're going to stop growing after what we've been able to do in the last 40 years. We're certainly not going to stop the ability to do that. So we'll continue that through accretive acquisitions and expiration success and what's in the pipeline. If it was 10 years ago, I'd be very worried about a hostile takeover bid 
for the B2 Gold right now, or not even a hostile. They might come as a friendly initially. And, you know, we, we have a lot of credibility in that conversation because we didn't want to sell BEMA at all. It was our baby. It was mine, you know, part of my life for 30 years from zero. But as I said, we, we, we believe in, in accountability and we had 75,000 shareholders. So when Ken Russ made a, a 38% premium offer, we never had a meeting at the management or board to say, gee, do we take this to our shareholders? We never had the conversation because it was, it was an automatic. We had an obligation to take it to the shareholders. So I, I, I would tell you the same thing now. We, don't want to, we do not want to be taken over. I don't really care what the price is. We don't want to be taken over, but it's not our call. But I, I'd be worried if it was 10 years ago now because by back then, companies were paying big premiums um, sometimes ill-advised, big premiums to take over companies. And it's, it's hard for a shareholder to turn down a big premium offer. But right now, with the, with the Rangold Barrick deal, where, where Rangold accepted a, a no premium offer from Barrick, when Rangold was down 40% the year before, um, that tells you that uh, that Mark Bristow is now running Barrick, who was Rangold. He can't turn around now, and he said it, he can't turn around and do premium offers for companies like ours. He won't do it because he can't do it given what he did with Rangold and Barrick. Shortly after that deal, we had the Gold Corp, um, the Gold Corp uh, Newmont deal announced, and that was a 17% premium for about a half an hour. So they came in and offered premium. The market you know, didn't like it, killed the premium right away. Um, that's another example that you're not going to see a lot of um, – you're not going to see a lot of big premium offers for companies like ours. So I like that because we want to keep doing what we're doing. And I don't think I haven't met a, 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 a yet to meet a beach gold shareholder who would be interested in a no premium offer from another company. You would, yeah, I mean, do you want to take Kinross shares for our shares? Why? Um, we are recognized as one of the best manager groups in the industry. Look at our track record. Why would you want to take a no premium offer? It makes no sense. So, I, and I hear that from all the shareholders. So, I think we're going to get to continue to do it for a while. And I like the fact that there's a little more discipline in the industry because the last thing shareholders need now is to go back to 10 years ago where people are paying stupid premiums for things, and and the, pro, the, the acquisitions they're making turn out to be disasters. So, I, I think you're going to see more M and I think it's I think it's welcome. You're going to see more companies of similar size get together. I don't mean to sound cocky, but I do believe in the merger of equals. We just have no equal, in my view, at this time. And I mean that seriously, because with the growth profile we have and our ability to do this, we don't have an equal that we would say, well, let's put the two together and two plus two makes six. We, we don't see that. Let's see what's in our pipeline. Um, we, we will look at opportunistic acquisitions as time goes on. But right now, I think our strategy is a good one. We'll stay with it. So... We we we're not we're not building this to sell it. Never been that was never the case in Bema. It's not the case now. Having said that, as I said, if we get an offer from a credible company um, with a big premium, uh, we'll be taking it to our shareholders. But uh, no one wants to do that. No one no one wants to go hostile on us. I don't think anybody wants me out there telling our shareholders why I hate the offer they made. I don't think they really want to take that on. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, and uh, certainly the responsible approach. I, I like your approach, and and you're absolutely right. Another uh, recent uh, no premium uh, Equinox legal transaction that's in progress. Another non premium. Let's yeah. talk live. Appreciate you hanging around. Let's talk about some other ventures for a moment. Uh, B Metals. Can you hmm. tell us just a bit about this company? Why you got involved, and what is the ultimate goal with this vehicle? Sure. You know, we're very committed to dedicated to what we do. So there's some people in Vancouver that might have, you know, several companies on the go and in our sector. And I've just never believed that. In my mind, that just lacks credibility. So we've always been very, very focused for years and years and years at BEMA and then similarly now for 12 years at B2Gold. Uh, we don't want to be distracted. I think it lacks credibility to go to your shoulders and have five different deals that you're trying to promote them on. I, I mean, I, I just couldn't see myself doing that. So we, we for years and years, uh, the, the BEMA years and the B2 years, we would have, because we're so international, and we're not just, you know, the, the history of our guys, a lot of our guys have worked in other metals, et cetera, in exploration and otherwise. Tremendous experience, not just in gold. So we were, were offered opportunities over the years in copper and everything else. And we always said, no, 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 no. We're, you know, we're beach of gold and we're a gold company. So unless it's a copper project that has a lot of gold in it, then that's not for us. So we always turned down all those things to remain focused on what we were. And then I guess it occurred to us a couple of years ago that, you know, we're getting these opportunities and we had, um, we, we thought, well, we're not going to run another company. That's just not going to happen. But what if we, with our expertise, uh, can become part of a, of a very highly skilled technical management team to go and look at base metals with us as the founding shareholders, along with management, but also, um, you know, some of us on the board of directors, but not, not running the company, but being there, 
um, utilizing our areas of expertise and on our, on our off hours, the few hours we take off a day, <laughs> to uh, to be able to advise and help as, as from a director's point of view. So so that's what we did with, with B Metals and, and um, John Wilton, who's the president and CEO, really well, tremendous experienced um, um, geologist and, and uh, really knows the world of base metals like incredibly, extremely well. So he was interested in, in, in being the guy on the, on the not not in a, in a very serious role as, as executive and the technical role. So he leads the charge, and you know you you know Derek and Derek's used to be with Bema back in the day and investor relations and, and and corporate development. So he's another very important part of the executive team. And for now, we're building up that team, but also that team has the ability to draw in a phone conversation, or whatever, from some of the vast experience that the, the directors have. And we think, you know, we think we should have a right to invest in other things, um, but we're never going to run another company. But I don't, I think I should, I think the B2 Gold shareholders are mostly okay with me being on the board of something. Um, I don't think I, they should begrudge me that opportunity. Part of the problem in Vancouver particularly is when you had guys that were on like 20 boards of directors or running six companies, it lost a lot of credibility. I well, never had credibility. So you had a lot of, I think, people overreacting or sort of to what else are you doing. I think I've shown over 40 years that my, where my commitment lies. But we had those opportunities, and so we said, well, let's see what we can do with, uh, with John and, and a very strong team of advisors. We have uh, Dick Silito, one of the top copper experts in the world, uh, who's an advisor. I met with him, wonderful man. Um, we have people like that scouring the world looking for opportunities. But right now, B-Metals uh, is a junior base metals company that has two interesting assets that are quite different. One of them is a past producer in Idaho, high-grade zinc, silver, some good gold grades. And it was a past producer, never never fully explored uh, underground. And now we've been doing, we acquired that and have been doing some drilling recently, getting some excellent results. We think we're on to something that's going to be a mine. The, the big question now will be, what's the size of it? And now we're drilling deeper than it's ever been drilled before and getting some really encouraging results. So that's one where um, we're, we're pretty excited about that. And then we also are in Zambia, where we have a very uh, exciting copper target. Um, and this area is interesting because there's, there's big copper mines all around us. The area that we're in is covered by a thin cover of desert. So there's great anomalies below it and some previous success with the big company, but no one really had the courage, um, or I guess they felt the need at the time, to drill below the, the sand. And we're doing that now, and we've been getting some really intriguing. It's early days, but we've been getting some really intriguing hits. It's elephant country when it comes to elephants and when it comes to copper deposits. Um, and we're intrigued by the possibility of that. So something like that, if you were successful in finding a major copper deposit, you know, that's the kind of thing you'd bring in a partner in at some point along the way. And there's big copper companies all around us there. So so we're scouring the world for other opportunities, but we're particular, just like in, B, in B, B2, we're particularly picky about what we do and where we spend our shareholders' money. Um, so we're looking uh, long and hard at opportunities in base metals, but I like the two assets we have today, and we're 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 doing going to be doing a lot more drilling in Idaho and more drilling um, the Pen Pen Guinea project as well in Zambia. So we don't really go out there and push the story out a whole lot. Derek's done a great job, and John have done a great job of communicating with shareholders what we're trying to do. But I'm not the great believer in trying to promote a stock to a certain level and then try to find something worth that number. So you don't go and promote something to a dollar and a half. Uh, even if you could in a better market, and then pray that you find something worth a buck and a half. I've never done it that way. Um, so Bema started and B2 Gold started out as you know as, as junior little junior companies, and uh, Bema was 3.5 billion Canadian, and B2 is now five Canadian or four billion US. So the question is, can we do it again? And um, we're 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 uh, major shareholders. I own 10% of the company, and uh, we're supportive of a great executive team, and we'll continue to grow the team. The executive team has this, I think, real benefit for all the shareholders to be able to tap into the knowledge and the, all this 280 years of experience that we have around here. But as I said, uh, we're, we're, we're never going to run two companies at the same time. We're going to continue to build what's a very strong executive team in B-Metals. And uh, I don't know, we're trading around 23 cents Canadian, so I'm still a big buyer of the stock because uh, at that price, I'm pretty comfortable buying a lot more of it. Um, because as I said, we haven't gone out there and promoted it, trying to get the price higher uh, for the sake of that. We, we want people, uh, like-minded people, to get involved at an early stage. So we've had lots of, of, of uh, interest, tough market, but there's lots of people looking at our track record saying, hmm, I wonder if these guys can do it again. Well, it's certainly a company that we're watching uh, and are very interested in and appreciate the uh, the overview and your thoughts on it. Uh, there, there's another small venture in which you're involved just at the board level. 
thoughts on the market for vanadium, Clive, and this company, Vanadium Energy? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, this is something I got involved with quite a long time ago. It's a complete diversification, just out of some some interest. And um, we 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 were we started in uranium, and that market obviously got very difficult. Had some interesting exploration projects there, but then we we got an opportunity in the in the um, vanadium world. And vanadium is an interesting product, of, of that an interesting metal, very rare and very valuable. Uh, very few vanadium producers, uh, vanadium producers around the world. So we we got involved in an interesting opportunity there in um, Canada, Manitoba, where a project that had lots of drilling for base metals and no one had ever really looked at the uh, vanadium content. So kind of an intriguing, contrarian move, um, a little outside the box, but we like that. But um, so that that's another one that um, very early stage, but we're looking at others, other other um, in addition to vanadium, we'll be looking at. Vanadium, I would say vanadium because that's what we named the, com- the company. But we will be looking at other um, other interesting metals, maybe back in the uranium space, partly as well. But other 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 metals in that in that group. So run by a really really um, really strong guy, Mark Simpson, runs that company. And uh, once again, it's uh, it's just something that I found that had a personal interest in saying it's kind of intriguing, and I invested some money in it. But um, I'm on the board, but I'm very much play a director's role. Appreciate the information on that, Clive, and certainly uh, I think your your actions with B metals and B2 have been certainly commendable, and 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 what you've done there. I don't think it's a, a bad thing to be on a board of a company or two, and it appears that you're very focused and probably work 16 hours or more a day like I do, and yeah. uh, so that's certainly good, and and we enjoy it. Now, outside of the organization, Clive, are there any people outside of the B companies? Um, that you are favorable of that have aligned with the type of value that you look for. Are there any particular people that come to mind investors should pay attention to? Well, I, you know, I think that um, on the gold producing side, you know, I, I think Nico Eagle is a company that's been around forever. You know, they're very well run. They've, they've, they've a solid track record. They've done what they've done very well. They're not quite as adventurous as we are worldwide, but they're very good at, at, at what they do. I, and I think they're, Good people, very serious people, and they, they run a good company. They're getting a lot more value in the market on a, a per net asset value basis than we are at the moment. But I just think they're one to they're one to watch. And if people believe in you know the gold in the future, they're probably they're they're one of the, the bigger companies worth looking at owning. Um, so they've got a great track record. Um, you know, the sad reality of it is when I look at gold producers, I don't. There's not a lot that I would own. <laughs> To be frank with you, uh, for so many of the reasons that I've outlined before, some of them are getting better. They're improving. I think Barrick's heading in the right direction. I like what they're doing there. I, I like. I, I know Mark Bristow quite well because, of course, we were both in West Africa when he was Rangold. Now he's the big. Uh, you know, he's a big guy at Barrick. I like what he's doing, and him and I have a lot of things in common. We believe the gold money business has to be run like a business, and and I know that sounds like such a duh comment, but it's so it's so so re- relevant in this world in the gold business today. Yeah, and, and so that's really refreshing, and I, we we all have to cheer him on, and I do cheer him on, and I like him. I mean, I you know he's a controversial guy, but hey, so am I. But at the end of the day, um, you know he he uh, he speaks his mind, and he and he tends to he tends to do what he says. So I think doing what you say maybe gives you the right to speak your mind. I don't know, but at the end of the day, uh, I so I, I, li- I like the way Barrick's heading. I think there's a couple other companies that are doing some good things. Endeavor Mining has done a good job. They're largely in West Africa. I know those guys well. They're good guys. They're very hardworking guys. They've got some very strong people and a good vision. Who else would I own? I own Caliber, but that's a different story because they're you know a smaller producer. But I like the energy there. I like the people. They've got some good technical capability, good expression capability, and uh, and they're they're driven in a good way. So I think that's one that's worth owning as well. Okay, and you and you just kind of walked into the next question I have here, and maybe we can just speak a little bit outside of maybe not the sec- sector equities, but maybe outside of that as well with with some of your more general investments, Clive. What does a Clive Johnson investment portfolio look like? So besides a, a large holding in your own companies, Clive, how are you positioned with sector equity outside investments, and what is your view and position with the holding of physical gold? Yeah, I I, I, um, I own some gold, but I, I think that um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm not I'm not a diehard gold bug. I don't think gold has to go to two thousand dollars an ounce. And then you don't want a CEO as a gold bug. I mean, if you got a gold company CEO as a gold bug, I would I would don't know if I would stick around for too long because he might be wrong and he might be making acquisitions based on the fact that he thinks he's right. <laughs> so two thousand dollars can forgive a lot of the poor acquisitions, but nobody knows if it's going there. 
I think my view is that for those people that, that buy gold as a safe haven, and I get that, uh, I think if you do believe there's going to be financial problems, let's call it debt, uh, other, other, other problems around the world, wars, etc., all sorts of things, if you believe that you need protection on the financial side from a financial meltdown around the world, then you should own some physical gold. But my argument to people is, if we get into a problems financially where gold starts to really roar because it's a safe haven and the wheels start falling off in other areas, sure, gold's going to go up. But the gold producers, the good ones, are going to go up so many more times than the gold price itself. So as I mentioned earlier, for every $100 that gold puts on, if it goes higher, that's another $100 million in cash from operations for us and profit for us. So if gold was to go to 2000 you can do the math and think what that would mean for us probably 600 million, 650 million this year in cash from operations. So that would multiply for each hundred dollars an ounce. That's a hundred million dollars of additional cash flow. So, th so I believe if you think there's the gold as a safe haven, own some physical, but if things really, the wheels come off and I'm not a believer in financial Armageddon, but if the wheels did start to come off, you want to own the gold stocks and they'll run up dramatically, the good ones particularly, they'll run up dramatically. And then if you really believe we're going to get into a liquidity crisis and a financial crisis where people sell everything, then you sell your gold stocks at huge profits and then you buy the physical. That's the way I see it because the physical is the ultimate protection in financial Armageddon. But, but on the way up there, there's a huge profit to be made by companies producing gold at a good profit. I think that's excellent. I think that's a good piece, and, and certainly on, on the board of uh, wealth protection, uh, certainly gold serves a purpose, and of course the gold equities serve a, a, also a, a significant purpose of a portfolio. Yeah, what you, can't print, you can't print it. You, you can't print it. <laughs> what are your personal plans? Are you sticking with this cycle and not leaving this business over the medium term? What is Clive planning to do over the next 10 to 15 years? I'm very much enjoying what we're doing. Uh, you know, to be honest, it makes it a little bit easier when you get a little help with the gold price. But I've, I've really, I mean, I'm so proud of what we've done in the last 10 years uh, and the way we've done it. Um, no, I'm, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, you know, as, as I get older, I, I, I may look one day to be, you know, to perhaps have, you know, look at a chairman role or something and, and, and beat you one day, you know, well down the road. But um, no, I'm very committed to, and it's not just me here, there's, you know, there's an incredible team. We've talked about some of the players, but there's an incredible coach, an incredible team. And we're also nurturing lots of young people. We're bringing so many young engineers and geologists as part of what we do into the fold here to learn our way of doing it. So, no, we have, a, I think everyone here has a very long-term commitment to this culture. And we always, you know, you have to have succession planning. So we have some great guys, some who have, I've mentioned within the organization. Um, so it's a long-term commitment. It's been a long-term commitment, but it'll continue to be a long-term commitment. You know, you asked just back to your other other question about uh, investing. What do I do? I've got my gold exposure because I own quite a lot of shares in B2 Gold. <laughs> I'm happy with that. Um, but other than that, you know, money's really hard to make, so I, I don't like giving it back. So my actual investment portfolio is really quite conservative because that's my FU fund because I came from nothing. And uh, if everything if everything does go badly, then, you know, you, I've got six kids. So, uh, so when I make money, I don't want to give it back. Um, and I've worked hard. I think I've worked hard to make the money I've made. So I take a pretty conservative view overall. But I've got significant gold exposure, and I think the best gold company on the planet, B2 Gold. I think that's a great position, Clive. I appreciate you sharing that, and uh, I certainly can agree with your view. Now, for potential investors who are listening, why should they follow you, Clive, and why should they take a hard look at companies like B2 Gold and even an early stage company like B Metals? Yeah, well, I think it's about, there's a bunch of reasons, but when we're reiterating now, but that's fine. To sum it up, yeah, track record. What have you done lately? Uh, track record, skin in the game, um, and those are two things I look at any investment I'm looking at. You know, what have they done? Are they founders of the company? Do they have significant upside potential to be motivated by that, as well as you know other things? But um, and also, I think I think in the modern world today, it, it really is looking more and more at the environmental side of things, the CSR side of things, because that's going to be critical. The companies that get it and you know, don't sign on later, I think we were, on the, we were on the cutting edge years ago about this whole movement towards green mining. And that's not, you know, we've embraced that a long time ago, not because it was the cool thing to do, which it is now. We did it because it was the right thing to do. So that's about accountability, fairness, and respect. Back to that I talked about earlier. So, And also, what are we going to do next? If you look at the fact that we had no gold production 10 years ago, and now we have a million ounces of production, very profitable production, and a pipeline of projects, and the ability to build mines anywhere in the world where we choose to go, 
um, I don't see us slowing down our growth profile. Well, we'll slow down at certain times to see what's in our pipeline, but that's still growth as well. So if you're looking at a gold investment today, as I said, this is the perfect one for generalists because I don't have to sit there and go, yeah, you got to buy the stock because gold's going higher. Um, I love the fact that it's a real business, and if gold doesn't go, if gold goes back to 1300 and stays there for five years, we'll make a lot of money. Our shares will go up, in my view, and we'll pay dividends to our to our shareholders. There's very few gold mining companies that can make that statement. There's very few gold mining companies that can appeal to a generalist investor. And I've had we've had great success recently. Lots and lots of generalists. And that's part of the reason our stock has moved. I guess the dividend obviously helps attract some people, but that's not why we did it. But I think I think uh, more and more we are one of the I hear from traders and brokers we're one of the four or five companies that comes up immediately when it's what should I own if I want if I do want to own gold what should I own um, not just because of leverage but because of the performance and the, and the credibility so that that to me that that that's you know we took a lot of chances and took some measured risks over the last ten years the last forty years but who's counting but at, and at the end of the day it's really nice to see them pay off this isn't paying off because gold's gone higher. This is paying off because we had a really good strategy and we stuck to it and delivered on the promises we made. So, if I, you know, if you're out there looking at gold companies today, I, I, I a little biased, I suppose, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think we check all the boxes, including the generals funds. No, I think you guys have prepared a nice moat around your business uh, from a mm -hmm. cost profile, from talent, from expertise. I mean, like you said, you could literally go anywhere in the world, uh, and and it just seems with the expertise that you guys have a lot of good chances on your side to be a success. And I think that's key. And certainly both companies, B Metals and B2 Gold, both offer a fantastic uh, proposition at current levels. Um, and we do like both companies, Clive. Well, how about the audience? Uh, how can they reach out to learn more about you and B2 Gold? Well, we've pride ourselves in being very transparent. Um, we've got a great website on both companies. Uh, and actually, for people interested in when you're talking about some of the things I touched on, which I didn't have time to go into because it couldn't be you know, very interesting, but a long presentation is with the CSR stuff. There's some great videos on our website about the cutting edge stuff we're doing around the world. Really cool things. Save the rhino, you know, rebuild coral reefs in the Philippines. Not one we didn't damage them, but others did. But just some of the really cutting edge stuff we're doing in agriculture, education. That's all on the website. And also through the website, people can reach me. Uh, Ian McLean is our um, the Vice President of Investor Relations at, uh, at, at B2, so we, we pride ourselves on transparency, so invite your uh, listeners to test that out. Try and reach me. <laughs> and if you can't, you can call me <laughs> and uh, say that uh, they haven't been able to reach me. But we pride ourselves on that, so uh, the website's a great place to start, and uh, from there on, we're always happy to talk to shareholders or potential shareholders. And uh, on the B-Metal side, Derek has done a great job there. And if he doesn't return your calls, let me know. <laughs> He's sitting right here. But uh, but uh, he will. And uh, John Wilton as well, very responsive CEO on that side. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, we'd love to hear from We'd love to hear from our shows and potential shows. Very well. And that website should be the letter B and then the number 2, gold.com, b2gold.com. Well, Clive, thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Best of luck. And I hope you come back again soon to update us. Well, thanks for your uh, questions. You're obviously very well informed in the sector and the space, and uh, I enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Andrew.